Hi, this is Rishi Agrawal, and this video is intended for first-year radiology residents who are just about to start their first rotation in chest radiology. I want to show you the lines and stripes that I look at on a chest x-ray. So here I have a normal chest x-ray, and I have a normal chest CT, and this is of the same patient, and we're going to use the CT to correlate the stripes that we see on the chest x-ray. Okay. So the first thing that I look at is the trachea, and the trachea is a midline loosened structure here, and you can see that it's normally deviated slightly to the right here, and that's because of the left-sided aortic arch. It causes that slight shift of the trachea to the right. The trachea ends right here in this triangular-shaped carina. Um, let me see if I can make that a little bit more pronounced for you. And that's the carina. Um, while I'm looking at the trachea, I'm also looking at the paratracheal stripes. So this is the right paratracheal stripe, and this is the left paratracheal stripe. And this, these paratracheal stripes are made up of um, vasculature. So the thing that forms the border of the right paratracheal stripe is the SVC here, and the border of the left paratracheal stripe is the left subclavian artery here. And normally the paratracheal stripes are pretty lucent structures, because in addition to vasculature, we're looking at the lungs, okay? These things overlap the lungs. Um, but they can be more dense or more um, convex if there's lymph node enlargement. So for example, if you have paratracheal lymph nodes, this border, rather than being more concave and fairly lucent, it'll bulge outward and it will become denser and the same is true of the right paratracheal stripe. Okay, so the next structure that I look at on the chest x-ray is the aortic arch and the descending aorta. So we mentioned that the aortic arch is just to the left of the trachea and it causes slight deviation of the trachea to the right. If you follow that line of the aortic arch downward, then that is the descending aorta. So in a young patient, the descending aorta should be very straight and it can, in this case, overlap on the left paraspinal line, which we'll talk about in a second. But you should be able to see it all the way down. And you can see it on CT. So this is, this is the left ventricle. This is the ascending aorta. Here we have the right brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. So if we continue that, here's the end of the aortic arch. We're going posteriorly now. You can see that straight line of the descending aorta. And the important thing to note about the descending aorta on chest x-rays and on CTs for that matter is that it's a posterior structure. So if you have something, for example, in the lung right here, then that mass or pneumonia could obscure the descending aorta. If you lose the line of the descending aorta, that tells you that whatever you're looking at, whether it's a mass or a pneumonia, is in the left lower lobe. Because you can see this is the major fissure here. This is the upper lobe, and this is the lower lobe. Because the descending aorta is a posterior structure. OK, the next structure I look at after looking at the aorta is the AP window. AP stands for aortopulmonary. And what it refers to is this little divot right here, this little concavity. And it's right between the aortic arch and the pulmonary artery. That's why it's called AP. And if we look at it on CT, this is the aortic arch. And then I'm scrolling backwards. This is the pulmonary artery. And you can see this is a normal patient. And so the only thing in the AP window in this patient is fat, fat in the mediastinum and that's why it's concave. If you were to see this as a convexity or a bulge, then that could mean that the patient has enlarged lymph nodes. Now the second part of the AP is the P, and the pulmonary artery is along the inferior border of the AP window, and it's this straight line here. And if we go to the CT, you could see that the pulmonary artery forms that contour of the mediastinum there. So aortic arch, AP window, pulmonary artery. OK, the next structure that I look at after the pulmonary artery is the left atrial appendage. 
So the left atrial appendage, I'm going to scroll backwards now, is right here. And you can see the left atrial appendage forms the border with the lung. This is the lung, this is the left atrial appendage. And then if I scroll forward here, the next structure is the left ventricle. So just going straight down from the left atrium, this is the left ventricle. Okay, so if we sum up the left-sided border of the mediastinum, we have the aorta, the AP window, the pulmonary artery, the left atrial appendage, and the left ventricle. All right, once I'm done looking at the left-sided structures, I then look at the right-sided structures, and there's not that many of them. Basically, you have the right atrium here, and if you continue superiorly, you have the SVC. Now, at some point, the SVC breaks into the, um, the right brachiocephalic vein and the left brachiocephalic vein, um, but after it breaks into that, you, you basically lose it, and you don't see that border anymore. But um, mainly the thing that makes the border in the right side of the mediastinum is the SVC. And this inflection point, the point where um, you lose this straight line and you start to get this curving line, that is the cavoatrial junction or the superior cavoatrial junction. It's where the SVC joins and dumps into the right atrium. And that's an important landmark because that's the location where you want central lines to terminate, ideally. The next thing that I look at is the azigoesophageal line. And the azigoesophageal line is exactly what it sounds like. It's the two structures, the azigous and the esophagus, and the interface that those structures form with the adjacent lung. And that line starts here at the diaphragm, and you can see it go up. And here, when it, we get to about the level of the carina, we lose that line and it just gets obscured by other structures. But that is a normal azigoesophageal line. But if we go to the CT, this is the esophagus. It's this lucent tube structure. And this is the azigous vein. And note that they're basically right next to each other. And what we're looking at when we look at the chest x-ray is that interface, the interface between the azigous and the esophagus and the adjacent lung. Alright, once you've cleared the mediastinal structures, the next thing to look at are the hyla. And the hyla are paired structures on either side of the mediastinum. And they can be difficult to evaluate and to know what's normal and abnormal on um, when you're first starting out looking at chest x-rays. But a few tips are that the hyla should be about the same density and they should be uh, about the same size. So if you see one hilum that's larger than the other or more dense than the other, that can be a sign that there's something abnormal. Another sign to look for is that the hyla should be at about the same horizontal level. Okay, if you see one hilum being pulled up or another hilum being pulled up, then that is an indicator that there's volume loss on that side. Okay, the hyla, if you, if you bisect the lungs where the hyla are, you should have about the same amount of space above and below that line. Okay, Most of the opacity that you see in the pulmonary hyla comes from the pulmonary arteries. Okay, Those are the most dense, largest structures in the hyla in a normal person. You also have pulmonary veins coming in, and then you also have bronchi. The bronchi are lucent structures, so they don't contribute opacity to the hyla. The hyla can be enlarged in patients who have enlarged pulmonary arteries, as in pulmonary hypertension, or they can be enlarged in patients who have enlarged lymph nodes. All right, once you finish looking at the hyla, the next thing to do is to evaluate the lungs themselves. So it's going to be hard to explain what to do and how to do this, you really just have to practice it. But in general, what I do is I look at each lung individually. So I'll use the magnifying tool and look at this lung and go from top to bottom, usually in sort of some sort of a zigzag motion. And then I'll look at the other one in the same way, magnifying it um, and looking at that lung individually. Then I zoom back out and look at both lungs, comparing the density, um, you know, comparing the size, 
and making sure that basically they look about the same. When you get to the rotation, we can talk more about the different patterns of abnormalities that you might see, but that's generally how I approach looking and scan, scanning for disease. Okay, once I've evaluated the lungs, the next thing I look at are um, the pleura. So the way to do that is basically to run your eye along the borders of the lung just to make sure that you don't see any abnormalities. So what abnormality might you see? Well, in the pleura, the most common thing is a pleural effusion. And in an upright patient, pleural fluid will collect here in the costophrenic angles. And you'll see, instead of a nice sharp angle here, you'll see a meniscus here if it's, if it's small. Or you might just see, you know, complete obscuration of that angle if it's a larger pleural effusion. Um, another thing you might see is a pneumothorax. So in an upright patient, go to the lung apices and make sure that the, lung ap the lungs go all the way to the pleural surface. You, know, you don't want to see, for example, a visceral pleural line here and then lucency beyond that line. That's a sign of a pneumothorax. Once I've finished looking at the pleura, the next thing I do is look at the bones, um, the soft tissues, and the upper abdomen. And that's especially important in patients who are coming in with trauma, you wanna make sure there's no rib fracture or clavicle fracture, no free air under the diaphragm. Now when you're counting the ribs, the easiest thing to do is start with the first rib. So the first rib anteriorly has this large sort of irregular costochondral junction here. It joins up with the manubrium medially. And if you follow that back, that is the posterior part of the first rib. So all you have to do from there is just count down. So this is the first rib, two, three, here we have clavicle, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Okay, so if you just start with the first rib, you, basically you can't go wrong. Then I look at the clavicles, I look at the scapula, the soft tissues, and the upper abdomen. And one thing to look for in the upper abdomen is free air. This is normal air in the stomach, okay? Um, you could see that there's rugal folds there. You could see that this air is displaced a centimeter or two from the, the top of the left hemidiaphragm. Free air will show up as a lucent line or a crescent, and it can be on one side, it can be on both sides, it can be under the right hemidiaphragm as well as the left. And basically you have to look at the history. So if it's an inpatient and you see free air, you know, usually it's a surgery patient or they've just put in a gastrostomy tube, um, but you have to make sure that you have something that explains it. In an ED setting, if a patient comes in with free intraperitoneal air, the thing to be worried about is perforation of the bowel or perforation of any hollow viscous. Once you're done looking at the frontal radiograph, the next thing to do is look at the lateral radiograph. There's a few clear spaces that you should be able to identify in all normal patients on the lateral radiograph. This is the sternum, and right behind that is the retrosternal clear space. This is the trachea, right behind that is the retrotracheal clear space, and this is the retrocardiac clear space. These are all areas of the lung that you should be able to identify on normal patients. Also on the lateral radiograph, you have these costophrenic angles here. And these costophrenic angles um, are a lot more sensitive in detecting fluid than the frontal radiograph. In other words, it takes a lot more fluid to show up as an abnormality on the frontal here than it is back here. Okay, it, it only takes about 50 milliliters of fluid here, whereas it might take maybe double that or 150 milliliters of fluid to show an abnormality here on the frontal. Okay, the other structures on the lateral radiograph are the hilar structures. So I'm gonna blow this up and point out this rounded lucency here. This is the left upper lobe bronchus. And if I go to lung windows on here, the left upper lobe bronchus is right there. So it's also called the left main stem bronchus, left upper lobe bronchus continuum. So you can see this is the left upper lobe bronchus. 
and this is the left main stem bronchus. Okay, and that's an important landmark on the lateral radiograph because there's a lot of structures that sort of go around it. So just anterior to it, you can see that there's this rounded sort of structure here, and that is the right pulmonary artery, which is right here. And then there's another structure that sort of loops over it right there. And if we go to the left side, that is the left pulmonary artery right there. Okay, and this interval going from about here to here should be relatively clear. Um, I don't know if you guys can appreciate that, but there's a lot more opacity from here to here than there is from here to here. And if you have a completion of this circle by opacity, that's something called the donut sign, and that's a sign of lymph node enlargement in the hyla and in the mediastinum. Another important sign on the lateral, if I'm going to zoom out here, is the spine sign. So the spine sign is um, a sign that is used to detect airspace disease in the lower lobes. So in a normal patient, the spine going from top to bottom should become more lucent as you go in that direction. And that's just because when you go up higher, there's a lot more soft tissue that the beam has to penetrate. And that's why it's more opaque here. And down here, there's a lot more lung. And so it's a lot easier for the beam to penetrate. And that's why the spine is more lucent here inferiorly. Now, if you are looking at the spine and you're going down the spine and all of a sudden see an opacity where the spine is becoming more opaque as you go down, that's a sign that there is an abnormality, perhaps a mass, maybe a pleural effusion, maybe a pneumonia that is obscuring the spine. All right, so that's basically a quick overview on how to look at a chest x-ray um, for first-year residents. Okay, um, this is not really meant to be a comprehensive learning tool, but sort of an introduction. Um, if you want a good text, I recommend that you pick up a copy of this book, Felsen's Principles of Chest Rankinology, a program text. So it's in its fourth edition now. But this is a really good book, and it'll show you how to look at chest x-rays, and including both inpatient and outpatient. And if you can finish this book, by the time you get to your first chest rotation, you'll be well ahead of the curve.